So what we're doing is developing technology and capabilities that we are presenting to the warfighter. And it needs to be quick. We need to be able to iterate. We need to test every 28 days, not every six months to provide this. And we start looking at leadership roles differently. We're looking at, hey, if you're as strong in this area, I should be able to expect you to be strong in this area too, or give you the supports to figure it out. So my CEO does a lot of coaching. She'll sit down and bring all of her leadership team and make sure the message is on the, the right page and that we are actually hitting the right targets. And so we have, I would say, one of the most diverse organizations in the, uh, in the enterprise, I would say. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the HR Leaders Podcast. On today's episode, I'm joined by Terence Cooley, who's the Chief People and Information Security Officer at the United States Air Force. In the episode, we talk about Terence's journey from cybersecurity to HR. We talk about the biggest lessons learned from military leadership and his growth and journey being a single foster parent and adopting a teenager. As always, before we jump into the video, make sure you hit the subscribe button, turn on the notification bell, and follow on your favorite podcast platform. With that being said, let's jump in. Terence, welcome to the show. How are you, my friend? Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. I'm doing pretty good, you know, another perfect day in paradise out here. And amazing. I, I was thinking about this uh, last week about, I knew he was coming on the show, and I was like, I'm gonna have my first chief people and information security officer on the show. And I was like, that's pretty cool. You're one of a kind, my friend. It's a lot of work. <laughs> do, do, do you even know of another chief people and information security officer? Do you even know? Of, I can't find one, no. by the way. No. <laughs> what typically happens is your chief people officer and your CISO are two different people who will consolidate. Uh, your CISO will work underneath the CIO. Yeah. We don't have a CIO. So it's just like, oh, guess I'll do it. Probably have to explain to our audience that CISO is the chief information security officer. Yes. <laughs> Just because we, we, we know, but like most people probably and haven't been exposed to that side. I suppose it's a good, good transition then because like your background is so fascinating and obviously explains kind of where we are now. Tell everyone a little bit more about you personally uh, and the journey to, to where we are now. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm 34. My name is Terrence Cooley. I'm an E7 Master Sergeant, United States Air Force. Uh, my first started back in 2011 as a radio frequency transmission systems technician. How old was you That's then? How old you, how old I you was then? 23 when I joined. Nice. Okay. I had a little stint in college. I was in community college, changed my degree three times, wound up there for five years. It's like, yeah, this isn't working for me. I just had someone else to tell me what to do, figure it out after it, fix it in post. <laughs> Love it. Okay. So after that, sorry, I interrupt. No, no, go for it. Go for it. Sorry, go for it. So after that, uh, I get picked up to work in Georgia. Uh, I'm doing a little stint there, doing some what we call base communications, where basically you have a, a high frequency radio tower and you're just supposed to maintain it, but it was always broke. So I didn't really have a job there. Uh, I did a lot of volunteering on the side and then I got a chance to work for special operations, just raised my hand to volunteer and said, hey, what am I doing? And I wind up working for the 38th Rescue Squadron. They actually got featured on National Geographic, uh, Inside Combat Rescue, great series to do a lot of awesome work. Uh, 11 months there, I got picked up to work at the first combat communication squadron in Ramstein, Georgia, or Germany, where I lived for three years doing a, lo a lot of really interesting work before I realized I'm now in a dead end career path because I've done three different jobs in essentially under a year. And so if I want to continue in that train, I got to go somewhere else. So I asked to what we call retrain. So we reclassify into a different job. That's how I got to cyber warfare, which is our cybersecurity division. And then from there, sky's the limit. Now I'm out here in uh, Sacramento. <laughs> so you never Sorry. planned on going down the cybersecurity route that kind of just took you there? Or did you, was you always very analytical growing up and had a affinity for, for that type of work? So weirdly, I, I didn't plan on doing cybersecurity. When I came in, I literally told my recruiter, I want to do something with computers. Because I like to tinker. I was building computers as a kid, just putting things okay. together, tearing apart. So you were interested I, in that from a young age anyway? That, that... Very, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. And so having a path to do that, fantastic. Computer stuff, all for it. It wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be, <laughs> but it was really fascinating. And I have gotten to do a lot of work on the world stage that... I would not have had an opportunity to do otherwise. And I like very fondly on that experience. Yeah. Was it quite, um, obviously I know most of what you did, you cannot talk about <laughs> uh, on a podcast, but was it quite, how, how was it being exposed to that type of, you know, being in that environment and being exposed to that type of information at such a young age? <laughs> 
it changes your perspective and worldview. So I used to think of a cell phone as a convenience. I used to think too much about, you know, open hotspots at Starbucks or McDonald's. <laughs> now I look at that stuff and I'm like, that's a trap, that's a trap, that's a trap. And I'm more <laughs> aware. Once you kind of lift the veil, you can't unsee what happens behind the side. Yeah. And it makes you very concerned, not just for the security of your information, but the privacy of your information. Mm. Were you quite shocked at the lack of um, understanding that the general public even have of half of these things? Yes. Uh, I can't remember the author, but there's this great book for anyone who's kind of even remotely interested in this topic. It's called The Cuckoo's Egg. And it talks about how cybersecurity really first came to be like a big deal in the US because there was a hacker who actually managed to maneuver their way all the way to like nuclear command back in the 60s. Really interesting book. So if you really want to deep dive in that topic, that is a great book told from perspective of someone who has no idea what's going on and they learn about it as they go. So you don't even need to have a technical background. Yeah. I think another misconception as well, and I, I got really fascinated with this topic for many years. And, uh, I, and I told you when we first spoke that I ended up my one of the companies I worked on actually working with chief with, with, with chief information security officers on a summit and a couple of workshops. And I got even deeper into it. But the concept of social engineering was one that I wasn't even aware of. So people think about cybersecurity, they think of just the computer element, the actual hacking element, but they don't actually understand the people side and the manipulation that happens there <laughs> that that really yeah. that was fascinating yeah. to see how clever and actually highly manipulative and intelligent people are but also how scary it is how people are willing to give up information without even realizing how valuable it is yes what's that saying you you get more with honey than you do with salt or whatever yeah. like that's how it is it's, it's technology is actually surprisingly a people-oriented enterprise and when you think about social engineering, generally it's taking advantage of people's willingness to help Can others. Can you share an example? Because I did a really bad job just then. <laughs> Could yeah, you? Because so, <laughs> I did a really bad job. One great example that I think a lot of people might recognize, if you're working in an office where, you know, there are some reasonable security measures, maybe you've got like, you know, a door guard or something like that. You might have someone who's carrying some boxes with them and they get behind someone else who's going in. It's like, hey, I'm just trying to get in. I can't, can't reach my badge. Like, no, I got you. I'll open the door, let them in. And now you've just let someone into your secure building who now can walk around and plug a thumb drive in your network closet. Yeah, as simple as that, right? Yep. Um, or, or, or like I saw some really good ones of you know people just calling up uh, a, a, an assistant of a CEO is saying, hey, I'm just with Jeff. He's just left something here and he's asked me to... Uh, uh, I've just found his wallet. I, I, found, I saw, I found a wallet. Could you let me know the best address to send it to and, and, and et cetera. I, I really need to return the wallet to him or something like that. And they just give all of the details, dress, contact details, email, <laughs> every, everything. And people just fall for it. It's uh, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> so how did you go from chief information security officer, you know, working cybersecurity to now chief people officer? How did that element come to be? Well, so that, there, there was like a ramp that sort of happened. When I was in Illinois, when I was working at the height of my uh, individual contributor role, I got picked up for what we call a green door job. Basically, it's a job where in the military, you typically just get told where you're going. And so for us, it's really novel when someone calls you to say, hey, would you like to work here? Uh, they call you. And I got picked up for this job out here where originally I was just going to build out the entire cybersecurity infrastructure. We had a change in CEO and going through all the people who were giving the briefs on what each of the, the cross-functional teams were doing. I, I guess I made some statements about, hey, this is where we're at. Here's the mistakes we've made. Here's the problems we've had. And here are the things that I'm interested in trying to fix. In addition, uh, I'm also interested in writing packages, words packages for people and getting people where they need to go and taking care of people. And that conversation led me into a point where I got picked up to be her executive assistant while still doing the chief information security officer role. And it's been a, a, a role where I've been continuing to be her trusted advisor. And I got moved into the chief people officer role because she had a huge issue of culture, wanted to maintain what we're doing that literally the building next door to us or the room next door to us, they are constantly having issues with people being drunk or having uh, being picked up by the police, having interpersonal issues, not respecting the differences in people's identities. We don't have those problems here because we've worked intentionally on how we maintain culture, how we make sure people get what they need. Employee engagement is a huge thing for us and our benefits is also a huge part because you don't get a lot of incentives in the military monetarily. So you really have to dial in those other aspects for the mission. Yeah, 
What was your opinion? What was your understanding of HR before versus now? <laughs> I had a little bit of a stint uh, for a brief period of time uh, as an executive assistant for a different uh, CEO, but that one was more like managing resource programs. So I kind of got to see oh, okay. a little bit behind the lens. I was like, okay, that's kind of how these things work. You hear some conversations, but other than that, I just knew that like HR is the people that, that you call when you have a problem and then the people <laughs> will call let you know you're getting let go. And that was it. That's most people's um, perspective, right? Because that's the only time yeah. they, that's the only time they see HR. <laughs> so, yeah, there's uh, a lot that goes on behind the bill. The compliance issues alone are just like holy cow. Yeah. Then you have to deal with the, the your HRI systems. You have to deal with the technology that goes behind it, and then all the other individual pieces. Yeah, I I have a vast, profound respect for people in this career field that I did not have when I started. Yeah, I'm interested to know what are the skills that you learned as a chief information security officer that have served you best and that helped you as a chief people officer? I would say one of the foundational skills is listening. We have a lot of very technical people. If you miss a part of what they're saying, you could lose the entire scope of what they're trying to say. Now you're, you're the guy who's like slowing down the conversation. So you have to listen to people. You have to be very intentional and paying attention to what they're saying. But also when you're working with highly technical people, they tend to be very um, unique individuals. What do you call it? Uh, I myself consider myself a very unique individual. And so you have to be very sensitive to their needs. It's almost like dealing with actors and actresses where they can sometimes have a larger than life personality because they built up the skills in the portfolio that commands that level of respect. And sometimes they let it get to their head, but you still got to work around that. And when you learn to kind of deal with different personalities, you can take that into HR and you start listening to people for who they are, not who you think they are. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure that must be really challenging uh, to, 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 to do that. And 100 percent is a skill. And I'm sure, you know, in the other role, listening, I don't want to be dramatic, obviously, could and understanding it could be the difference between life and death uh, or it could be the difference between a security breach or not. So you really listening is probably listening in your world probably means something very different <laughs> to, to, most, <laughs> to most people. Absolutely. And it's also something I picked up from my kid. Uh, so I do foster parenting on the, on the side. It's not really how uh, it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that. My mom would probably say the same thing. And my mom's a foster parent, as you know, from our last call as well. So go, so go and carry on. Apologies. So, uh, well, listening to kids is a little bit of, it's the same skill, but it's a different, there's different impacts there because kids don't have often that same vocabulary. They can't tell you quite how they're feeling. So you have to kind of work and tease it out of them. Mm. And so you learn a lot of counseling skills and you could take that directly to the workplace where you're able to discuss with people and really reach the root cause of what their actual issues are so that you can address that directly. Uh, so I learned that from my kid. Yeah. Was there any... Um and differences or nuances that you that you see that, uh, in terms of when we talk about military leadership versus traditional corporate leadership, is there any differences that you absolutely? <laughs> like, There's. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I worked with some Navy SEALs um, very briefly when I was in 38th Rescue Squadron, working with the uh, pararescue troops out there, and one of the things that they talk about is a, a shared trauma brings people together. So everyone in the military goes through basic military training. It is a miserable, depending on which service you're at, it's six to 13 weeks of being shouted at, being made to do push-ups, being told you're wrong even when you're right. Someone makes a mistake and the whole flight's on their face doing push-ups and stuff. And it brings you together because you all have a shared trauma, so to speak. And when you're able to talk like that, you, you have a more a sense of, uh, of camaraderie that you generally just don't see anywhere else. And that allows you to come in to an organization and immediately, because you wear the uniform, you've gone through the struggle, you know where you're at because you can see someone's rank right on their rank, right on their chest. And that gives you a sense of belonging that you might not have anywhere else until you've kind of built up to it, that you just get day one from walking into an organization and then you work up or down from there. Yeah. Well, how do we do that in the workplace? You know, we don't want people standing in the water of holding a boat, a log over their head. <laughs> <laughs> trying to, trying to, how, does, how, have you, how have you managed to help translate that <laughs> into the organization? 
There are a number of those um, personality tests that are out there. Like mm -hmm. disc is a good example. We yeah. used four lenses just to abstract so people can have a general language to talk to, to give them a common ground. Mm -hmm. And what I like about four lenses is it's just four colors, gold, or green, blue, and orange. And they represent different things. And using that as a baseline, we got someone to assess us and say, here are your, your color profiles. At a very high level, this is the kind of person you are. Taking advantage of that, now people can say, oh, and now I understand why you behave that way. You're a gold and I'm a blue. And given that baseline, people started talking much more comfortably with each other because now it's like, I can understand our differences. Yeah. Something you mentioned to me last time and uh, it, st it stuck with me is I, I think I said to you something along the lines of like, did you have any challenges around getting into this leadership role at such a young age? And I asked you like, what are the, like, is there, oh, is, 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 is there a traditional career tra tra trajectory that you have to take in the military? And, and so if you could you share like how that works with everyone? Because, yeah. you know, there's not many 30, you say four? 34, yep. 34 chief information security and people officers um, out there. And I'd love to if you to explain it to everyone because I think it's pretty fascinating the way it works. Okay. Yeah, so you start off, unless you do take some incentives or whatever, you start off as what we call for the Air Force, uh, Airman Basic E1. You go through basic military training. And then over the course of years, you have to keep a certain amount of time, what we call time and grade, how much time you've held that, uh, I guess the equivalent would be a job title. But for us, it's called a rank. And you move up through the ranks, the early ranks, pretty quickly. Then you test to get through your uh, middle management ranks, our NCO, non-commissioned officer tier. And then at the, when you get to E6, when you're trying to bridge into E7, which is your senior management type roles, at that point, you are being, uh, your records, your entire performance appraisal record are being put up against a board of your peers. Or by peers, I mean like our E9s and then one officer who will preside over the board and they will just carve through your record and say, are you, do you have the potential to serve in this higher grade with higher trust and responsibility? And going through that, you can, what we call fast burn if you hit certain benchmarks. So for my, for me, when I was in E4 or E3, I got promoted to E4 six months early in a process we call below the zone. So I proved to my peers I was a top 15% performer and I was able to get a little extra time. That time then allows me to test for E5 earlier, which then allowed me to test for E6 earlier, which allowed me to get to the board earlier. So I made E7 at 10 years. Uh, traditionally, you wouldn't even make E6 until, on average, 11 years. Wow. that's And uh, is it pretty linear in terms of your salary, if I'm asking? Is it like soup, the same, is it like brackets that go yes. along up with that? Is that how it works? Yep. Uh, all the all the salary information is uh, public domain, but essentially you have two categories, your rank and how many years you've served. And so as you progress, you'll change your rank and then say I hit 12 years, I get a, a pay bump every uh, every year annually, and then we get a different pay bump every even year. So you might go from a place where you're at E6, and you might promote on an even year where your pay will go up, like, you know, maybe five or 600 bucks. But for the most part, it's pretty, pretty linear. There's a nice little jump from E4 to E5, and then a nice little jump from E6 to E7. But it's a pretty, you know, pretty mm. straightforward with a couple bumps. Yeah. Did you, does age ever play a factor? No, no. Uh, this is maybe the closest to a meritocracy as I've yeah, no, experienced. Yeah, you, your records are, your records are what determines your, uh, your promotion. Until you get to the really higher senior ranks where it's not just your records, it's your reputation that is then being considered for the ranks to hit the top two and top 1% ranks. Yeah, it's so interesting. It's so far away from typical route in organized in you know in corporate um in the corporate world where you can be um judged you know based on your age and you know oh, you know i i and i experienced this because i started when i was 17 in in my company it was like ah you're too young to be a director you're too young to be a manager you're too young to even have an opinion in the boardroom <laughs> i've even been in there being like oh, chris you know you don't have the experience and i'm like just because you're 20 years older than me i still spent 10 years selling to our customer i think i know our customer and bear in mind i started at 17 so of course i'm still young even 10 years later <laughs> uh, as well but that doesn't seem to be the case uh, you're rewarded based on that and it's clear it's linear people understand it as well it's just pretty it's pretty amazing 
it's just very different. How do you think that that shapes the culture of the organization when in other in corporate sometimes it's like people trying to climb over each other to get to the top? Do you not have that, or does that still exist? I know I'm, uh, going, I know I'm going a bit off it's, topic, but it's really interesting. Uh, it's it's different. Uh, I would say you experience something like that a little bit more in our E7, 8, and 9 ranks. And then from the officer perspective, O1 through 10, that's kind of more of that world. And it's just kind of going to real, real briefly. Essentially what happens is there's a limited number of promotions for each job group. So my, what we call Air Force Specialty Code would be 1B, 4X, 1. So that's like cyber warfare operations. Only so many of us can promote each year. That's so awesome. your records really have to stand. And for the, port, the people who have to test, you also have to test. So you could lose the opportunity to promote just based on not being able to pass the test. And then your records do matter. And as you get, as you start narrowing to how many people can actually promote to those higher ranks, what you did in the past does matter. So you have to start considering that from an early point, especially for the officers. But as you get closer to that, you're competing with your peers on a more equal footing to a certain point. So mm -hmm. then your reputation matters. And so you have to kind of get out there. You have to network more. People need to know who you are. And that can lead to some folks who are like, yeah, I, I think I'm better than that, that guy. So I'm going to kind of, <laughs> you know, elbow my way in the front, or I might, you might see people who mischaracterize their records and not get in that, get caught. And that could get them promoted based on someone else's work, or they mischaracterize the work of their subordinates. I am judged on my leadership at this rank. I am judged entirely on what efforts my team did that I influenced. But I can't say on my performance appraisals that I did the work. It has to be phrased very specifically. And you have people who might not say the difference between team member accomplished this, and they just say accomplished this. <laughs> and that could be the difference between getting promoted or not because they mischaracterized their work. Oh, wow. So, yeah, su super interesting. Um, uh, uh, but it's, it's, I love the fact that they're so open that even, you know, given your background, that they saw the potential in you to lead the HR function. Um, it, it's so unheard of. Like, literally, we, we both laughed at the beginning of this episode. We cannot name one person. I cannot name one person that's, that has a similar <laughs> role to yourself that exists. So, because people, I, I, maybe it's just my bias, I look to the military and think, I, and I, when I think of how they operate internally, I think it's very old fashioned and very like. <laughs> and, this kind of is. And I, no, but the, the, the innovation of, or, or, or them seeing for you more than just a title, they're seeing you, your, your capabilities as, they're looking at everything. They're looking at your character, they're looking at you as a, as a person outside of that. And they saw the capabilities that you have to lead this HR function, despite the fact that you spent your entire career in this other area as well many yes, just I, don't do that i i agree and even in the military this is uh unusual it, the specific organization that i i'm leading through is one of the few organizations i would say that actually if you're familiar with the agile framework yes uh, we're we're very much using that and that is counter to a lot of what the air force is i never doing. would have thought that you had an agile methodology <laughs> no i <right? laughs> that sounds bad to say that's amazing yeah. It's very specific to our CEO's leadership. When she came in, she looked at what we were doing before, which was follow, following a very staid process, but we work in a rapid capabilities office, or under the rapid capabilities office. So what we're doing is developing technology and capabilities that we are presenting to the warfighter. And it needs to be quick. We need to be able to iterate. We need to test every 28 days, not every six months to provide this. And we start looking at leadership roles differently. We're looking at, hey, if you're as strong in this area, I should be able to expect you to be strong in this area too, or give you the supports to figure it out. So my CEO does a lot of coaching. She'll sit down and bring all of her leadership team and make sure the message is on the, the right page and that we are actually hitting the right targets. And so we have, I would say, one of the most diverse organizations in the, uh, in the enterprise, I would say. Example, my CEO, the black woman who's a rated officer. What that means is she flies planes. You don't see that a lot, right? Mm. Then you have me, uh, technology, also very African-American. Uh, there are two LGBT, uh, LGBTQ individuals in our front office, so the commander's support staff, the CEO's front desk, very, very much, and there's two females in the office as well. We are very diverse, not only just in the front office, but in the entire organization. I think we have uh, at least 30% of our workforce is female, and then from that, 
two of them hold ma major leadership roles. One of our enlisted who works in our operations section is the stakeholder for the Department of Air Force's targeting campaign for this specific uh, enterprise. Wow. Just based on our capabilities and our merit. And what do you think the driven that? Because uh, is it the leadership? A hundred percent. It is driven from our top because the rest of our the rest of the supporting organizations don't really understand our work model. And so we have to constantly explain that to her. Others said, you talk the talk, you better be able to walk to walk. And our folks have been given empowered, trusted to actually make these strategic level uh, discussions without needing to go through corporate, without needing to go through our leadership. They're trusted to get the job done. If they make missteps, we correct. But we trust our force to do what needs to be done to accomplish it without obviously ethically but we trust our team and that has just paid dividends we don't have problems that you might see in other organizations like our i talked about the organization to the right of us we don't have those problems here yeah how, how does that make you feel as an african-american to see that and as and as obviously the chief people officer it's a it's actually a really uh weird feeling because uh because we're so transparent about how our processes work, what we're trying to accomplish, what the culture is. On one hand, it feels, you know, just like it's just another Tuesday. Uh, but on the other hand, it is really empowering that I don't have to think about it. Like we didn't pick people because you shouldn't of have to. their diversity. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The fact that you shouldn't have to. If, if, if we did things the way we should have, we shouldn't even have to think about it. <laughs> this is what it should just look like. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I love it. I, I suppose it must help you in terms of, uh, but from a, a function perspective to attract and retain a diverse pool of talent though right because when they come Absolutely. in to interview or they can, they can see it they're talking they're talking to people that look and sound like them um you know you can talk the talk but they're seeing it internally <laughs> they're meeting the people like yourselves as well so that must really help you and the team as well Absolutely. And one of the benefits of our organization that you don't really see in the rest of the military, I talked about how we have the ability to directly reach out and hire people. So we can take advantage of the folks who are in it to, and this is, I know, this is a really novel concept, but network to hire talent that's already been vetted <laughs> and then only interview them once. But in, we with, don't with, have 12 with, interviews. But with we don't. You, yeah. Other organizations in, within your, within, within the military probably have a very lengthy, long arduous process they don't get interviewed they just get picked someone up at the top level goes this this number goes to this position really and they attach name to the number and then that's where you go oh wow yeah okay. so it's really for us it's really innovative to be able to go <laughs> this person is the great fit for the job oh and they also happen to have these other characteristics that's so, yeah it's so novel to hear that it's so different um as well but again it empowers you and the team is this going to continue to compound and shape your culture that you have almost like a subculture <laughs> within your yeah. within your how, do you ever get to network and benchmark with other leaders within the different units absolutely and i've even reached back to some of the previous units that i worked with now many of those folks have left but some of the standard operating procedures that I worked on are still in place. So I can kind of reach back to that. There's a large community of what we call uh, standardization and examiners. That would be your certification folks, the compliance folks that we have for our specifically uh, who I reach back out to will be our cybersecurity fields and try to get some of the best practices, make sure that we're still staying in touch with what the rest of the force is doing. And we've actually used some of our connections to we have a very small footprint here for our actual cybersecurity team on station. So we leveraged out and connected with one of the larger organizations that provide cybersecurity for the rest of the Air Force in very specific ways. We're a strategic program, so we're able to have them actually provide 24 seven monitoring for our program. And then our folks can focus on local triage and reporting rather than okay. trying to entirely run the program with you know, five people. Yeah, uh, that it's just not feasible to have 24 monitoring when I have a flight of people who have 100 people who can do that. And that's their full time job. So how many people do you have in your team? What's the current setup you have? Right now we have 36. We're losing a number of people through the fall and then we don't get pickups until October. And then we're getting a nice hiring surge between October and early 23 and then a few uh, follow ons in 24. And do you have like a traditional HR structure in terms of roles or is it, or is it different? Just out of curiosity. Uh, I wish we had a full team. I have a team of 11 people mm -hmm. and two of them are my HR specialists. 
Okay. And they manage the all of the HR programs wow. with me providing oversight. And so a lot of it is we hire people who are very good at their not just being good generalists, but they have specific areas so they can complement each other. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's two people. And then I have another individual who kind of provides oversight for a lot of the talent management type prospects uh, and aspects of our system. And that combined is the, the majority of our HR function and the rest is risk management. Wow. I suppose you've got time to do the show with me. <laughs> Is that what you, what do you want to team? What about in terms of like uh, your, your own um, power in terms of like making decisions on like investing in the function? You, you kind of like, well, I've just got to work with what I got in terms of like, if you're looking at, for example, on like a HCM or software tools, et cetera, how does that work? Do you have to kind of go up the chain for, um, for things like, how does that work? <laughs> so, so it's really interesting. I, it's twofold. I, like you would think that working in the technology role that I should be able to have a lot of influence on the technology, but a lot of that is Air Force derived policy on what you can have on the system, mm. on our, our actual workstations. So a lot of it is working with what we have and we are, love it or hate it, uh, we use Microsoft Teams for a lot of our processes to manage our SOPs, manage our onboarding processes. And so we, we maximize that software suite. In addition, we have what it's been given to us because we're the government. Uh, it's a 60s style uh, information system that it, it'd be very hard for me to be kind. I can see the pain. It is a I useful can, system. feel the pain. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is uh, definitely a struggle. Yeah. And so we try to minimize we have a lot of focus on that just because that's what we have to work with, but anywhere else that we can innovate, we are absolutely looking to innovate. Mm -hmm. What would be an example of an area that you have the opportunity to innovate in that you have? So for our talent management, specifically, I want to talk like our, our awards program. Mm -hmm. There are some specific guidelines that we get for if we're putting someone up for an award with the categories they are, how we manage, who we send up. A lot of that we can do internally. And so I can just walk over, have some conversations, who are we putting up, make sure that their supervisors are putting up a reasonable package. And then I can take my time to work with our other enlisted leaders to build up the package to be a very strong one, mm -hmm. submit it up. And because I can focus on those aspects, yes. we typically, when we send up a, a worst package, if we don't sweep, we're taking eight out of 10 of the categories because of the work we do, the polish we put in. And if we lose to another person, it's either because of politics, because if we're winning too much, they want to spread the love up at the higher levels. All right, fair. You got to play the game. Or because <laughs> we didn't put our package up as strongly as we should have. Yeah. So there's, there's an element of the, you've got to play the game and understand how the system works uh, internally, but you've been there a long time. So, 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 so how much are you spending on the cybersecurity side versus the chief people of the role? Because I have a, a strong team of two other individuals who are doing cyber warfare, plus two other individuals who are actually onboarding to manage a lot more of the the day to day systems, the system security type stuff, mm. I've been moving a lot more out of that role, where my team is responsible for figuring out integrations, targeting very specific narrow avenues where we can get the most bang for our buck, and then finding partnerships to fill in the stop gaps. So most of what I do for that is giving them oversight. Here are the areas we want to hit. Here are the targets we need to hit. Where are we at so far so I can brief that up? What are the things that we what are the things that we have accomplished so that when we have, you know, very important people coming in, distinguished visuals coming in, I'm able to let them continue working and then I can just talk about how awesome they are. Yeah, well, that's what you want to do, like you said earlier, right? You're there to remove yeah. remove bottlenecks for them, give them support the support that they need and then get out the way. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> the, the last thing you want is a leader that sometimes i, I i'm the culprit like i realize sometimes i'm like what's going wrong why are we not moving anywhere and i'm like oh it's me uh, it's, <laughs> oh it's me because i haven't given something or i have not or, or <laughs> it's normally us as leaders uh which they're in the way um yes uh, i think of well. it as upside down pyramid right where yeah. <laughs> all of the important part is now this broad base at the top. And I'm here at the little tiny holding it up, just Blocking like, it. <laughs> look, I have, this is my role, is to resource you and not slow you down. Yeah. Well, last time we spoke, you mentioned mindset versus perspective. Could you elaborate on that for everyone? Yeah. So you can see me. I, uh, I look like, I still look like I'm 12. Uh, the headset you're like, helps, you're like the my glasses co help. You're like my co-founder as well. He looks like 12 years old. <laughs> Eternally youthful. <laughs> And so there's a, there is a little bit of that when you walk into a room, even though you see the rank, they see the uniform, they're still like, 
are you lost? And <laughs> you, you kind of have to work through some of those things. Uh, but it's not as bad in the military because you, you do have that baseline that you have to work with. But when you're walking into an organization, you have to think differently. A lot of times the perspective of when you walk in is what people see of you. And so if I have folks who don't see me out there enough, they see me up in the golden castle or whatever, just throwing out edicts or whatever, uh, I'm going to get a very different response from the team and the rest of the organization, as opposed to when I'm spending more of my time out there sitting down, talking to them, like I'll spend 30 minutes talking to one of my coworkers about their motorcycles. And then as we go through the conversation, I'll kind of start injecting, hey, you know, let's think about these things. So they start changing their mindset in little ways on different ways to think about the problem. And what I have seen is that tends to lead into their work. When you're talking to them about work things, they start thinking about the problem differently. If you are talking very positively in the organization, you will get more positive results from your team because they'll focus less on the negatives. So you change the mindset on what the expectations are, what the targets are, what's actually good and what's actually bad, what's meaningful, what where you need to spend your focus on, you get a lot more of that result me growing into this role has been a mindset shift because coming from a, a management perspective and then moving into a more executive function, it changes from I'm not the individual contributor anymore, but I'm the enabler for success. And that took a minute because I wanted to just get in there and start doing things. And one of the things I had to work with, with especially with my HR team, is I wanted to learn all the processes and then I wanted to do them. But then like, no, no, no. This is why you got I a have, team. <laughs> this is why I have them. They are specialized. They can do this better than I can possibly do it. And once I got out of the way, especially for the performance appraisal, they were sending them to me and I reviewed them. And I was like, this is something I'm interested in. Yeah. But it actually caused the process to take longer. And so I cut myself out of the process. And I was like, I trust you. Let me know if you have questions about specific things that only I can answer, but you can do that. And just changing that mindset. The, what are the things that only I can solve? Yeah. That's what I should be focusing on. And then making sure my team can, is only focusing on the things that only they can solve. Yeah, That was the big moment for me when I started to really get what my job is here. I think we can all relate to that, right? Like I remember I was an individual <laughs> sales contributor for like six, seven years. And then I became a manager and I just wanted to be on the phone and closing the deals. And I think just, and like, no, no, this is not your role anymore. Because before it was just Chris looking out for Chris. And that's pretty, it's like, all right, cool. I, I'm, I own it. Yeah. I own this. So now my, my success is measured by the success of my team. And that took a lot of getting. And no one, told, no one prepared me for that. No, there's no <laughs> pipeline for this. Yeah. I didn't, and unfortunately at the time, I also didn't get any management or leadership training either. So I was just winging it like most people. Oh, Chris is great at sales. Sure, he's going to be a great manager. It doesn't work that way. You've got people that are great individual contributors and you have great leaders and managers and they have very different skills and very different roles that need to take place. I was actually speaking on that point with uh, the chief people officer of Lego, uh, Lauren, uh, Lauren Schuster, and he was in the sales team as one of their global leaders and he had with zero experience in HR is now their chief people officer. And when I asked him that question, when I was interviewing face to face, you know, how did you like with zero technical understanding of HR, how did you get on in the first like, you know, six to 12 months? He went, Chris, well, that's why I've got an amazing team. And it was so obvious. And I was like, so if, if I have a question around people, I'm like, it's Chris, I asked Melissa, because that's why she's here. I hired the best person for the job. Absolutely. But, but it takes many years to get to that stage where you realize that though, um, as well. Um, I want to touch upon your, you mentioned uh, briefly earlier, you know, you're a single foster parent. What drove that decision? Um, and, and how do you manage balancing being a parent and, and the role that you have? Ooh, uh, yeah, that's pretty much the core of who I am, right? <laughs> uh, so I grew up in what I would call a, a conflicted home environment. And I, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. Like I had a mom who was putting everything out for herself. Um, my biological dad passed away very early, but the, the image he gave me as he was literally dying in front of my eyes was he would come out there, he would play with me and he would do so with what I could only describe as honor and dignity. Uh, even in his final moments, that's the impression he wanted me to have as, as, a, as a father, even if he wasn't that person before. He changed himself to be that for me. And as a kid, I didn't recognize it until my parents really, my mom really explained that to me earlier, later. But when my stepdad came in the picture, I struggled with that because 
uh, he was a Marine and he had a hard time t- bringing his work or keeping his work and life separate. And so a lot of that uh, animosity he had because it wasn't the right fit for him came home. So there's a lot of disagreements, there's a lot of emotional and physical abuse that was happening in the sense like, you know, we don't do spanking anymore, right? Uh, that was his default go-to. Uh, and so I did not have a great family life. And so what I wanted to, and what I found is mentoring kids in school, especially when I joined the military and realized what volunteering was, I realized I, I want to give that back to kids. I want to be able to take something from them. Like, hey, you don't have to worry about these things. You don't have to have a parent like that. And I was doing a lot of mentoring, especially like playing video games. You'd see, I would play with uh, like the same kids. I'm like, all right, hang on. I need to talk to your parents. And getting involved with their lives, I actually had some who flew me out. One flew me out to Houston to spend some time with them. And that was a really cool experience. But like at a certain age, you got to like, all right, I got to do this in a more formal way. And foster care was the obvious solution. They always need people, especially for older teens. Yeah. When I got involved with that back in 2017, the first kid I had was 14 years old. And that, <laughs> they don't really, they give you some training to prepare you for it, but nothing prepares you for being a, a parent of a teenager who's got a lot of trauma, a lot of needs, and you have to just figure it out. And I have a saying, you don't really, uh, you've never loved someone until they punched a hole in your world. <laughs> and you have to just work through these things. You just, you just work through them. <laughs> Uh, building up a support network is really important. Being able to understand what kids need is really important. And my love of growing kids into what they should be and taking away that animosity and giving them a, a safe place to live really drove me to stay with it. But I struggled with the foster care system itself. Uh, I had a 10-year-old who they gave me 21 medicines he had to have. And I had to document that daily. That's a lot. When I went through the list of medicines, some of them were things like naproxen. It was like a a subscription that he was supposed to have for a a one-time event, but I had to continue prescribing him because I had to get a doctor to tell me he didn't need it. And it was going to take two weeks to do it. They're like, no, we're not, we're not doing that. And so because I didn't go through the process, I I got my wrist slapped for that. Even as they were telling me we would have done the same thing. And so the system itself is where I realized there's a problem there. So after three kids who uh, were fortunate to move on to better households, I left that system took a break and now i've come here in california where i'm adopting my 14 year old and instead of fighting the system i just adopt them out of the system now so as a as a single parent though the balance is um (laughs) (laughs) that's a little different so i've had to have a really supportive work environment to start because there's a lot of legal requirements like i have to make sure my kid gets certain family visits with his other uh, biological family i have to make sure that i get certain visits from cp or the child protective so services even when you adopt them they you they still you still have to they still have to, still have to have visits with their biological parents oh uh, no once they're out of the system once they're adopted all of that goes away and they're treated like all kids should be treated so okay. i can parent them however i want and i can choose to have them continue um having those visits and mm-hmm. if it's in their best interest i would continue that okay so is your son adopted right now or is it foster fostered. uh he has fostered the court hearing on when the adoption timeline will be is actually this october oh. and based on how things are going uh the adoption could complete as early as this january maybe oh, even good luck man that's amazing yeah, fingers crossed yeah oh wow okay so you're all in <laughs> you're, you're absolutely all in. And, and i get it by the way and it because uh, as i said my my mom's got uh, she normally has like three kids at a time she's fostering and uh, th- th- many of them stay with us for years, have stayed with us for years, and they're, they're family. You know, and Morgan, she's just got, she's reached, uh, um, she's 16, maybe after year 16, and now she's, she's moving out. She's uh, going to college, and it's, it's like, one, one, you're like really sad, but also you're really happy because she's got this independence. And when she first arrived, she was, you know, she, she, she obviously, as we said before, she comes with the baggage and she would run away and, Fight, trying to fight my mom and all sorts of, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and you're like, well, like, but you get it, right? If this person's been dragged around constantly from from pillar to post, and and uh, and my mom kind of, my mom's quite strict. I kind of, <laughs> she's like, if you're gonna be here, be here. I'm not gonna chase her around, but if you want a loving family that's gonna take care of you, this is this is the place. And I think she just needed that strong figure in her life to, and then she she's a different person now. Like, honestly, if I showed you her now, like two years ago to where she is now leaving, it's like unrecognizable. It's, it's actually incredible to see it um, as well. But it's tough. It's not for everyone. It's, 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 I think people, a lot of people maybe like the idea of it, but as you've experienced, it's, it's, it's hard. 
is difficult as well. It is. You start in the middle of their lifespan, essentially. Yeah. You miss all this stuff, and then you've got to start from there, and you have to fix one problem at a time. Mm. But it, it is um, astounding what consistency does for someone and what a stable and how important a stable house life is for future success. So I, I'm thrilled to hear that she's going on the college because typically, if they're not adopted by 16, it's not a zero number, but there's so many zeros before you get to the next non-zero number that yeah. it, they essentially become unadoptable because no one out there knows that if you can just get through that first six months to a year, they change because once they yeah. have that stability, that mm -hmm. consistency, then they're like, you're my family. Because they're constant. I felt with Morgan, like she was constantly thinking that my mom was going to let her down. She's been yes. let down so many times before that that trust, it takes so much time to build. Understandably. Yes. Like she's just waiting for us. I, could, I felt like she was just waiting for us to disappoint, you know? Uh, yeah, that's not uncommon. And we just have to be consistent. And I think my mom, you know, grew, bringing up four kids on her own, she, she was pretty strong <laughs> from doing And we weren't the best behaved kids <laughs> growing, <laughs> growing up either. So she had to go through that. Um, how, how would you say that that's shaped you as a, as a leader? I take these lessons back home to work every day. Uh, cons learning consistency in the home directly translates to work. Like if I'm consistent at home, when I go to work and I realize I'm being inconsistent, I, I tell my team the same thing I tell my kid. If I'm telling you two different things, call me out on it. Because like I can't, I can't tell you you're in trouble. And then you're like, no, actually, last week you told me that was okay. Like, well, yeah. All right, that's on me. Hey, then, kids, right? are, kids remember that stuff as well, man. They do <laughs> for a long yeah. time. Remember when you did that? You're like, oh. <laughs> they do. They also teach you to be more precise with your language. If I tell him, he can have a vegetable for his dinner and he picks the potatoes like French fries. Well, I should have been more clear because <laughs> French fries are made of potatoes. That's a, that's a vegetable. They're smart as well, aren't they? They're very kind. Yeah, so cunning. yeah, they're very get you on little things like that. Robin that translates to the workplace too. Where you're developing contracts and things like that where you're working with people. You, you're What you say, we're, crazy thought, words mean things. Yeah, who would have thought? <laughs> Honestly, I feel like we can go forever. Like your story is so fascinating, man. Like I'm so happy to, to see you're in the role that you're in now. And I hope everything goes well with, with the adoption. I know you're going to be an amazing parent. And um, yeah, like what, what, what's next for you? What are you most excited about? Obviously the adoption, but like what else? What, what, what's sort of looking at the next six or 12 months? What are you looking forward to most? Okay. <sighs> okay. So hopefully in the next couple of months. So I have a small business on the site where I do how, real estate wait, investing. Wait, how do you have a? <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! Take, how do you have a small business on the side? We've got we come from all of this. Go on, go for it. Tell me more. <laughs> okay. I don't know, where are you getting this time from? But I'll go for it. <laughs> all right. So one of the one of my favorite parts about being in the military is they they make you move a lot. So I've been fortunate where I was able to, my first home was in Illinois. Mm -hmm. I come here, I bought a home here and I kept that other home and rented it out. And so you kind of take advantage of the things that are already happening. If you're forced to move, keep your house, rent it out and then go somewhere else, have a property manager deal with the day-to-day -day stuff. I don't yeah. get phone calls at 2 a.m. And then when I'm ready to sell, the property manager typically can also be a realtor if they mm -hmm. have the license. So they can do all that for you too. And you already have that trust relationship with them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is just, I do operations management. I might spend five hours a week max this point I do five hours a month because we have a process in place. And so when I'm going to sell, there's just whatever happens comes up, they'll let me know and I'll make a decision on it after if it goes above a certain price point. Otherwise they're good to go to do whatever. And take Amazing. Care of it. So I'll just take advantage of, I try to maximize and layer the time that I'm using so that if I'm doing, if I'm already doing one thing, what other things can I do there? So I'm getting the most value from it. So it doesn't ever really feel like an extra lift. Yeah, why am I not surprised that you have that <laughs> approach <laughs> to, the, to those things? So you see that for you, that's kind of something you're, you're really investing for the future, right? Uh, to Absolutely. Put, so like, so you have like a clear strategy of your, for investing your money in, in, in real estate and that will probably be your, or probably be your retirement fund, right? <laughs> to I would say one of, the, one of the nice things about being in the military is if you can make it 20 years, you get a pension, and it's based on, you get essentially what you're working towards is 2.5% of every year you get towards your pension to uh, your salary. So after 20 years, just to kind of throw the math in there because public math sucks. If you yeah. make it 20 years, that's when you're first eligible. You'll get 50% of 
for those of us who are in what's, the, what's called the high three, they actually discontinued that in 2019. So it's a different policy. But for me, it's 50% of what I made the last three years uh, is what I will get for the rest of my life. Wow. And if I stay longer, that percentage goes up. Uh, so you can get, you know, all the way up to 75%. Or if you military retire, or, or if you're like an officer who can go like 40 years, whatever, yeah, you get your 100%. 100%. Wow. Yeah, it is possible. But you're, you're also committing... 40 <laughs> plus years of public service right it's so not it's enough. not easy no 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 of course oh, yeah. of course do, do um you know i'm gonna leave it there because there's so many more questions i have but thanks so i'm conscious of your time like i've gone way over what i should have but um it's been fascinating i, I hope i get to meet you one day and uh meet your meet your son and uh yeah it's, it's pretty where are you based again i'm out here in uh sacramento right now yeah uh, but I'm always looking for overseas tours. So if I ever finally make it back to the UK, absolutely. Let me know, man. Well, listen, I wish you all the best of everything. And thanks again for coming on the show. And we'll do this again soon. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thanks.